Hello everybody, this is Shane with Shane's Books and Review, and I hope that you are having a wonderful day today. And this is me from the future. That doesn't make sense right now, but give me just a second and it will. When I originally shot my video for Sherlock, The Return of, Part 1, it was going to be five of the stories so that I could split the video up. In the grand scheme of things, whenever I edit this all together, I cut out all the riffraff, get all the little lip pops and air conditioner and vehicles and whatnot out of the video, it still is in total of an hour and 20 minutes. Then on my second cut, I got it down to 40 minutes. I'm like, all right, cool, making progress. But the problem with that is, you guys probably don't want to sit through a 40 minute video. So I'm going to split it up even farther. The first video is going to be the first two stories out of The Return of Sherlock Holmes, which was, by the way, wrote by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And those two stories in this video now will be The Adventure of the Empty House, followed by The Adventure of the Norwood Builder. If you guys do want longer videos, let me know that you do in the description, and I'm okay with that. I just didn't want to hit you guys with that long of a video without you saying it's something that you would be interested in. So that's it from future me. Now let's go back to the past. The Adventure of the Empty House. First I want to point out that this is the first story of Sherlock that was after the final problem where he was miraculously brought back to life. After looking up some information, it appears that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was having to deal with quite a bit of public scrutiny. And his other books just hadn't quite done as well, so I suspect maybe it was more of a more of a monetary motivation for him to bring him back to life. For people like me and others that have really enjoyed reading Sherlock Holmes, I'm kind of glad that he did cave in. Maybe? It seems like even though he did bring him out of the shadows from a extraordinary explanation of what had actually happened at Reichenbach Falls that he didn't skimp on the character. So kudos. Good job. The Adventure of the Empty House opens up in the year of 1894. As we open up in 1894, Watson has pretty well kept his interest in crime and trying to solve crimes in the detective process that Sherlock was trying to show to him and teach him. Watson goes to a crime scene where it seems to be a impossible murder. It's a locked room. There's no way that anybody got in or out. Specifically, the individual murdered was the Honorable Ronald Adair, son of the Earl of Maynooth, a colonial governor from Australia. And the Honorable Ronald was sitting in his, I think his estate room, working on some papers when everything happened. And the notable thing about that was that nothing was took. Nothing was rifled through there's just a dead body. Now, while on site, Watson runs into a plainclothes detective, and more notably, a scrunched up elderly old man carrying some books, and knocks the books out of his hands, apologizes, and tries to help him get the books up, but the guy disappears very quickly. And you would think with the anger and the, the spitting and spatting that the old gentleman gave towards Watson that that would probably be the last time that he would see him. However, later on in his study, the old man shows up and after he pulls one of those, hey, what's that? Then we find out it is indeed Sherlock. So it needs to be said that even though Sherlock had died, he was now brought back to life by the whim of the writer. And Sherlock gives a pretty good accounting of what happened. He apparently used a made-up form of martial arts to help him defeat Professor Morati down the falls, and just in the nick of time, managed to scramble his way up to a ledge just far enough above where other people, like Watson and the detectives that showed up, wouldn't be able to figure out where Sherlock went. So he laid there and watching and waiting. And suddenly a huge rock lands next to him and bounces off and goes down the falls. And he thought, wow, that was a close one. But then another one came. He glanced up and saw the guy's ugly mug and decided to hurriedly climb his way back down and escape. Well, he ran for his life and he made his way to Florence. Because he knew if there was a gentleman that had that much hatred for him still that was working with Professor Moriarty, that he would probably be chasing after him. Now Holmes 
does make sure that his poor dear Watson is sitting somewhere before recounting the story and make sure that he can take it because he did give him quite the start whenever he revealed himself as being Sherlock and not an angry old man with books. Now, during the time period that he was absent, he was traveling the world. He met a head llama in Tibet and a Norwegian explorer by the name of Sigerson. Sigerson? Sigerson. And also eventually ended up in France working on some chemistry type things, chemistry experiments for a coal tar derivative. But it was the murder of Adair that brought him back. During the time period that Sherlock was incognito, the only people that really knew that he was alive was his own brother, Mycroft, and uh, the baddie that was on the top of the cliff. So Watson and Sherlock take off on a adventure, upon Watson's agreeing to help, of course. And Watson gets drugged through the streets in places that he didn't even know existed, through this, through that, through the other, and they end up at the old Bakersville address, in a way actually across from it. And the reason why is Sherlock has laid a trap. He's sure that the person that murdered Adair was also the person that had the air rifle and the henchman that was on top of the falls. So he has Mrs. Hudson to move this wax bust of himself that he had made. She has to move it every 15 minutes and apparently it works. And it works a lot better than what Sherlock was expecting. As they are hiding in this adjacent area, Watson notices that there are some people that are in the stairway a couple houses down and thinks that maybe it's them. That's the culprits. But while they're waiting, they hear a click and a slide and some very soft footsteps coming down the stairs. This guy crouches down like a bad evil villain and then starts scoping out the area that he's in, being the bottom floor. Walks right by Watson and Sherlock and doesn't see them ends up setting up a gun, which is the nefarious air rifle, opening up the window and shooting the wax bust in front of him, thinking it was Sherlock. Now at that time, Sherlock springs into action, jumps on top of the assailant. He gets brained, being the assailant. They call for the police. They give it him in handcuffs. Whoa, is the story. So Sherlock did get his man. But the man got tired of Sherlock awful quick. The person that got brained by Watson and detained by Sherlock and arrested by Inspector Lestat is none other than Colonel Morin. And Colonel Morin is the same individual that was throwing the rocks down the cliff face. Also, he was involved in another thing a, in another book with the air rifle. Colonel gets incredibly tired of hearing Sherlock run his mouth. so. He's like, look, you know, you got me dead rights. All right, fair enough, fine. But could you please shut him up? Inspector Lestrade is going to arrest the colonel for trying to assassinate Sherlock. And Sherlock's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to keep my name out of the papers. This is the same gentleman that was responsible for the other murder as well. And, oh, you have done such a great job with your bravery and your intellect. Look at what you have accomplished. You have solved the murder of him, not me which is typical Sherlock. He tries to stay in the background. The more interesting aspects of the story for me had to do with the alleged air gun, because it had been mentioned before, Sherlock was afraid of it whenever he was running from Professor Moriarty. And there's a couple of reasons why. Apparently, it seems like it is some sort of spring-loaded mechanism that shoots rifle bullets very effectively and efficiently. I'm guessing it's spring-loaded because in the descriptor of where the assassin was setting up the air rifle, he had to lay on parts of it to push it down and get it to snap into place before he put the bullet into it. I am no expert. I could be completely wrong on this. But it just kind of makes sense in a way. Some of the speculations at the end of the book on why Colonel would be wanting to kill his partner, Adair, kind of came to the same conclusion of it. He got caught cheating on cards. And threats were made, and then after threats were made, then it had to be backed up. End the first one. The Adventure of the Norwood Builder. This is going to be the second story we talk about. Watson and Sherlock get visited by a very not happy individual. A one John Hector McFarlane, who is a young lawyer that has been accused of murder. Not only murder, but murdering one of his clients. A builder by the name of Jonas Oldlicare. 
Just 24 hours previous, he had been visited by Aldecare, and Aldecare wanted him to drop a will for him, in legal language, as it were, and that McFarlane was going to be the sole inheritor of all of his properties, monies, etc. And McFarlane was baffled because he didn't understand why he would want to do such a thing. So to properly do up the will, he had to go visit with Aldecare. And so McFarlane went to Aldecare's properties to visit with him because there were some documents that needed to be examined for him to finish up his job. Upon completion, McFarlane went to a local hotel, stayed the night, and in the morning read about the murder of his client. It seems that the body was burned, but the thing that ties McFarlane to all this is one, he was there in the area, two, his stick was found in the murdered man's room. So the evidence seems quite damning against McFarlane. Now, upon recounting his story to Sherlock and Watson, McFarlane ends up being visited by Lestrade because Lestrade was going to Sherlock, I'm guessing, for help and ends up finding his man. Voila! Enter Lestrade. He's starting to become a favorite. And he is a bit of a major peacock. He's got a big ego that needs to be stroked. So Sherlock starts his own investigation. And in his investigation, he does something that throws Lestrade for a loop first right off the bat. Instead of going to where the murder took place, he goes to visit with McFarlane's mother instead and finds out that McFarlane's mother had dated Aldecare quite some years ago, but whenever she did find out how mean and evil that dude was, she decided she didn't want anything to do with him regardless of how much money he's got. The next stop that he makes is where the murder of Aldecare took place and he inspects some of the papers and starts to come up with discrepancies. Like some of the papers that were being investigated, it was more than likely wrote on a train or an extreme haste. And also in his banking, there was a check that kept coming in from a Mr. Cornelius. And Mr. Cornelius was the only one that had this odd check that was happening once a month. And it really wasn't accounted for who or what or why that person was getting some. And then there was the discrepancy of the rooms while he was walking around. He noticed that there was a difference in hallway lengths and room lengths and that there was apparently a missing area that they just could not access. Upon investigating the actual ash of the fire, he does find one of the buttons from the care's pajamas, which is pretty damning for McFarlane, which is of course sitting in a jail cell at this point. Uh, and then Lestrade proudly presents his final nail in the coffin, the big bloody thumbprint. Sherlock, upon Lestrade saying, this is the finality, it's the end, this, this, is, this is it, he's our man. Of course, this is out of left field, and everybody's took it back, and of course they do it. And they start yelling fire, and then the murderer of Oldecare pops out, because he's afraid of dying in fire, of course, as anybody would be. He was in a hidden room the whole time. Oldecare tries to explain, hey, it was just a prank, I thought it was funny, ha ha ha. But, you know, quite really, is that kind of funny? And not so much. Lestrade questions Sherlock and says, why wouldn't you just tell me outright? Why go through all this? And Sherlock was like, well, remember that peacock stuff you did earlier? Yeah. Yeah, I had to have some fun after that. When Odecare is actually caught, then it is revealed the whole reason why this is happening isn't because of the good fortunes of McFarlane. It was actually indeed due to him dating McFarlane's mother years ago. He wanted to exact revenge. For being turned down. The banks do seize the fake Mr. Cornelius's accounts. It was suspected that Oldecare was going to take off with his new identity being Cornelius, and he did owe the creditors quite a bit of money, so it all came down to that in the end. And of course Oldecare swears revenge upon Sherlock, but Sherlock very serenely just brushes it off like it was nothing. Here's my question to you. Have you read this story before? And did you have the immense enjoyment that I did when Sherlock played with Lestrade? Much like a cat and a laser. Part one is done. Congratulations. Thank you so much for watching. If you have made it this far, you are beyond awesome. You are beyond mortal. You are incredible. Thank you. If you happen to have seen anything in here that you think might inspire somebody to read some Sherlock or ignite a conversation, feel free to share it to somebody that you think would enjoy it. If you happen to be new here, we would love to have you join the family. There's a subscribe button. Looks like these. Down there. These? These do nothing. But the ones down here do. So click that subscribe button. And speaking of subscribe, please don't forget about the bell so that you'll know when the next video comes out. If you happen to find a good book in between now and the next video, please do let me know about it down there in that description. 
and we will check it out. We'll read it together and perhaps have a conversation. I would love to do that. Again, today's book has been The Return of Sherlock Holmes, Part 1. Hope you enjoyed the video. Again, this has been Shane with Shane's Books in Review, and I will see you in the next video.